Hi and welcome to JC Talks. I'm your host, Justin Caffrey. These are honest and authentic conversations about how I recovered from trauma, the tools that I implement to sustain my mental and physical health. And I share the ideas and infrastructure that I use with my own clients on a one-to-one basis. These conversations are conducted in a live audience. And if you would like to participate, please drop me an email. Now, let's move on, and I hope you enjoy today's talk. So, thanks everybody for coming. I um, appreciate it. It's a, it's a beautiful, warm, sunny night. So, I'm very grateful for anybody who um, is taking the time to, to be with us tonight um, for this talk. Tonight's um, talk is, is an interesting one because it's something um very very close to my heart in the context of of my own life but also my own work and how i work with people and one of the key things that i tend to work on is is trauma and that can be a variety of traumas generally speaking everybody at some point is going to suffer from some type of trauma i listed the types of trauma on the introductory email, but it can be mental health, both with yourself and maybe somebody else in your family. It can be cancer. It can be grief and loss. It can be a job loss or a company failure. It can just be trying to to cope with and and, and navigate COVID. So there's there's so many things that fall into this idea of trauma. And I wanted to kind of address them a little bit from a neuroscientific perspective and then talk to them in the context of recovery and and how how I work through them. And then we'll kind of broaden it out and and and, and open up a conversation for anybody who wants to to get involved on, on the trauma side. But what's interesting is we understand now how the mind processes information. So the mind has a very binary approach to how it sees things when it comes into our life. And if it sees something that is traumatic, it very simply treats every interaction in a binary sense. It's either a threat to life or it's okay. It only has two options. So every time it sees something, threat to life or okay. So when a challenge in your life comes along, and let's take an example of losing a loved one. You lose a loved one, and it's very, very painful. So the nervous system and the mind come together, and they think, Mm, this feels deeply painful. This is a threat to life. It's very dangerous, feeling very uncomfortable. And it then decides to file that trauma into the back of the mind where it files everything that it doesn't really want you to see, nor does it want you to really go towards again anytime soon. And an interesting example of that can be Often when children lose somebody at a young age, might be losing a parent, might be losing a sibling, it becomes an incredibly traumatic situation. And they move that into the trauma file. And then every time anything that looks or feels like that comes along, it triggers this connection back to trauma. And that child can feel really quite perturbed and very quickly emotionally stimulated. And they can bring that through their childhood. And then of course, as most of us do, they then bring it into their adult life. And it can build fears. So it can build a really strong fear around the whole idea of losing loved ones again. A real deep fear that, you know, I may lose another loved one. It's happened once, so it could very easily happen again. So they then get caught in this loop 
of building a fear. And it can actually then lead to fears like commitments because I don't want to get too close to somebody because I might lose them. So where a trauma starts, and if it's not spoken to or looked at, through to where it can end in later life, it can develop into many different things. And we know from an evolutionary standpoint why this tends to happen. So when we would have been in the you know, last 500 years, 5,000 years, 10,000 years, building society, it would not have been unusual for us to encounter something that would be really quite traumatic. And the, the reason for being, the, the raison d'etre for, for human beings is to, to procreate. You know, our, our, our primary objectives are to seek shelter, to feed ourselves, and to procreate. We are a civilization, and that's the underlying mechanics under which we operate. And anything that gets in the way of us developing needs to be put to one side in order to maintain these kind of prime directives that we have and built to us. So it wouldn't be unusual 500 years ago that we may actually see a member of our family slaughtered in, in the most traumatic of circumstances. And we could be exposed to extreme trauma because war and social instability was, was really quite normal. So in that situation, the brain has a very simple mechanism. It says, ah, I see something traumatic in front of me. Is it okay? Or is it a threat to life? If it's a threat to life, I'm going to file it in the deeper, darkest recesses of the mind. And once it's in there, the only reference I need is if anything else reappears that looks like the same thing, I'll quickly look at it. I'll play a quick flash in the front of the memory to remind the person, ooh, last time we're in this situation, something terrible happened. And then the person moves away, retreats, and moves on. So very helpful from a human evolutionary standpoint. But in the 21st century, the things that really are going to be a threat to our life are quite minimal. And if you think about it, the, the idea of seeing something horrendous like your family being murdered two or 300 years ago in modern life, okay, we will, of course, lose our partners and we'll lose our children. You know, doesn't happen all the time, but it's a fact of life. And, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a sad um, statistic in that regard. But when I lost Joshua, my, my mind and my nervous system looked at this and it went, oh my God, this is a trauma. This is a threat to life. So it filed it away into the deeper, darkest recesses of my mind. And that meant that whenever I encountered anything that looked or felt similar to that loss, I would get a flashback. And it would bring me back to that moment. And then I'd want to escape from that. Wherever I was, I'd want to just get away from that moment. So I'd need to move to somewhere else to escape it. So of course that could be have a drink, go for a run, try and get away. And it works for a while, but as we move on, it becomes more and more difficult. So the idea of the trauma is, do I keep it back here or do I bring it out here and actually lean into it? Because in reality, losing my son or somebody who's lost a partner or a company failure or losing a job, when we really get inside it, we start to understand that it's not really going to hugely impact me, but actually, the more I try to run away from it, 
the more it continues to pursue me and the more distant I feel from myself. So when we think about the evolutionary standpoint, great for our ancestors who were running around for maybe 30, 40, 50 years, but not so great for us when we're still very healthy and active in our 80s and 90s. The traumas and the challenges that we face in life are building up and building up and compounding. And the more that they appear and the more that they go inside us and the more traumas and the more issues that we face, the more anxious we become, the more stressed we become, and the more likely we face depression. And if you think about it, if you are struggling with anxiety, stress, or depression, there's always key events. There's always a trigger. And it's quite normal when I start to work with somebody that I'll say, you know, we're going to go and move towards the trauma events. And often it can be not the event that people really think it is. It can be the event further back. And ironically for me, when I was in therapy myself um, seven years ago, I went for therapy around my son, but actually he was the straw that broke the camel's back. There was other traumas that had not been resolved going back 15, 20 years. And when I started to unpick them and step into those scenarios and relive them as a 45 year old man, I was able to start letting go of some of those events. And this is always the kind of challenging point around trying to understand what does that look like and, and what is letting go. If we have problems in the past, so let's take, let's take an example. If you have a problem with your parents and, and you grew up and let's say your, your, your mom or your dad was an alcoholic and maybe abusive to your other parent. That's a pain that you carry for all of your life and quite often something that you would find particularly difficult to talk about. But that pain is a very deep emotional pain and it's kind of with you and it's yours as long as you want to continue to hold on to it. And when you have these deep emotional pains going back 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, they're always going to rear their head. They're always going to pop up. It's always lurking in the background. So I work with people around the idea of looking to forgive the aggressors who've hurt us. And again, this can be really quite controversial because even to the point where I've worked with people around the whole idea of forgiving people who've abused them physically, mentally, sexually. Because as long as we still carry the burden, we still carry the pain. And the abuser maybe does or does not carry something, but in real terms, it's not relevant. And often when I work with somebody who is, who is an adult, it's not unusual that even the abuser has died. They're not even here anymore. So it doesn't matter if the, if the abuser is alive or dead, the pain still is as bad, irrespective of their life or their death. It doesn't make any difference. Because the pain is an internal pain. The pain is the trauma that, they, that you filed in your own mind. And you hold on to the pain and you try and make it through life with this pain. But it's a, an extraordinary burden to carry. 
And it can be as, I say, as difficult and as simple in the context of finding those key moments and finding the person who has harmed you. And in the finding of the person, whilst you're in therapy, what we would do is we would start to see the events as they happened. So relive them in your mind. And you do this with your eyes closed and you'll be visualizing it and you'll be seeing the events unfold again. Because what you've been playing in your trauma mind has been a very small snippet telling you not to go there, don't look. But what we want to do now is not watch the trailer. We want to take out the full length movie and watch what really happened. And forgiveness then becomes multifaceted because especially in the context of abuse, it's not just the idea of potentially going to forgive somebody who may have abused us. It could be emotionally, sexually, physically. Abuse is the most traumatic thing that can happen to a human being. But quite often, we have to also learn to forgive ourselves as the victim of the abuse. So it's not unusual for me to work with somebody who's 50 years of age, 60 years of age, and they may have been physically or emotionally abused or sexually abused, and maybe they're 10 or 12. And at the core of that feeling is, I, I let it happen. I didn't stop it. And I've never forgiven myself for the fact that I didn't stop it. And you may have heard the whole idea of inner child work, and this kind of starts to step towards that. When you can be the 50-year-old who can then watch this movie back, but realize that what they're watching is a 10 or 12 year old version of themselves. You can then move to the next stage to say, well, at 10 or 12, you didn't have all the knowledge you have at 50. You didn't have the physical capacity to be able to stand up for yourself. You certainly didn't have the intellectual capacity to do so. More importantly, you were probably driven by fear. So the emotional or physical or sexual abuse was perpetrated upon the person by somebody who's manipulative and able to control the situation. But what happens is we hold on to our behavior at 10 or 12 and we measure our behavior for the rest of our lives based on the timeline where we are in our lives looking back. But when we're able to then see ourselves as a child, a big part of dealing with those traumatic issues in the past is I'm going to forgive myself because I didn't know any better when I was that age. And that's a whole process that, that takes um, at least a session in therapy and then it would move on to i'm going to forgive those people who have hurt me and i'm giving the example here of emotional physical or sexual abuse because this is the most extreme but it's not unusual in therapy that we start to look at you know i was bullied in work I bullied in my relationship i was treated badly in work i was treated badly in my relationship and each of these things are all mini traumas and each thing has the same impact on the nervous system. And each time the nervous system goes, oh, this is a trauma, follow it away into the deeper, darker recesses and anything that comes near it and looks like it, let's run away from it. So people build phobias. So we are often unpicking phobias by finding traumatic events and then disassociating the trauma from the thing that you're fearful of. And then all of a sudden you see yourself 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and you see the event and you see the perpetrator 
and you find the capacity to step away and forgive yourself. And then moving to the point of forgiving the perpetrator. And of course, people will go, oh, well, you know, why do I want to forgive him? And it's this person, you know, he or she was the most terrible person in my life. And, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to forgive them. They don't deserve it. We're not issuing a public um, forgiveness notice in, in, the, in the main evening newspaper. We're doing it on our own, in the safety of our own environment, and really speaking to our own nervous system. Because when we start to let go, we regain control of ourselves. And it's not forgiveness in any kind of religious or Christian sense, not at all. It's simply about letting go. We hold on to so much inside. And the pain of what we hold on is the torturous part of our lives. And the idea of letting go, and it comes to like even the most difficult thing in our life, when we start to do that, the freedom that it starts to create, the spaciousness that starts to open up, the understanding of ourselves can really be quite extraordinary. And when I, when I did work on myself um, many years ago, and I started thinking that you know, losing my son was my trauma, but then I found huge challenges with my father, who was very unwell as I was growing up. And coming to terms with that young child who struggled to see his father being institutionalized, who struggled to understand why there was no emotional relationship. He struggled to understand why his mother could have no relationship with him because she was dealing with my father. And I saw my, my aunt, his sister, commit suicide during this period of time. So all of a sudden, I realized that there are multiple perpetrators or actors within my life. And when I start to let go of each one of them, there's a spaciousness and a freedom and an acceptance. And then I can deal with letting go of Joshua's death. And speaking about Joshua's death is quite easy now because I take Joshua dying out of the traumatic memory and I move him into my normal memory because I can't influence and control Joshua dying. It's happened. I can't influence and control my father being institutionalized when I was 11 or 12. I can't influence or control my godmother committing suicide. What I can influence and control is how I react and how I deal with my emotions. So we're doing or attempting to do work on ourselves, finding that capacity to understand the journey in the context of where have I come from and what's happened in my life? What is the summation of my parts? And often, as we call this idea of limiting beliefs, the things that hold us back and I do work with, with senior executives. It's very typical that where they are right up there, but they're never really getting to the next level, they just start to find something that holds them back. And that can be a really challenging relationship in a work environment that they had when they were 25 years of age. And that continues to impact them. They don't know it. It's not, it's not rationally spoken, but it's embedded inside this traumatic brain. So it's not unusual that in that scenario, we're actually going through past colleagues or former bosses and forgiving them and actually calling them to mind. Their eyes closed, they'd visualize them, they'd bring that person forward, go through a process that, that takes 20, 30 minutes. But within that process and at the end of that process, it is forgiveness because the only person who suffers when you hold on to it is you. And I'll just finish with the Buddhist fable of 
I'm sure many of you heard before, but two monks who are traveling between two villages and they come along to um, a river and there's a woman who's carrying some bags and trying to get across the river, but she can't get across. So there's a young monk and an old monk. And she says, could you please help me get across the river? And the two monks stop and they look at the woman and, and look at each other and consciously aware of the fact that they are both unable to touch or hold a woman. And they've taken some very serious vows. But she's in distress. She needs to get to where she's going to. So without further ado, the older monk picks up her bags, takes her by the arm and guides her through the river and gets her to her side. So he then picks up her stuff, picks her up, takes her through the water, puts her down the other side and off they head off into the, into the hills. And they travel for the next few hours and the younger monk is beside himself. He can't believe what he's seen. This is the person who is supposed to be his spiritual guide, who's supposed to be giving him all that he needs in the context of development with his own spiritual practices. And now he's seen one of the key tenets of, of their vows has been broken. So after three or four hours, he eventually just flips and says to the older monk, I can't believe what you did back there. You know, you... You picked up that woman, you helped her through the river, and you did everything that we're not supposed to do. What example is that for me? And the older monk says, well, it's very simple. Yes, I picked her up at that moment, but two minutes later, I put her down. Four hours later, you were still carrying her. You have the pain. I took action. And that's really the key of what we do in the context of trauma work. It is getting us away from the idea of holding on because the holding on is where all the pain sits. So I'll take a break from talking for a minute. If anybody if that resonates, if anybody agrees or disagrees or sound crazy or can you can you get a sense of the fact that there is an opportunity to find forgiveness for people in our lives and you, you don't need to do this to the face you can do this to your face to their face if you want but really more often than not it's not even necessary it's just the idea of letting stuff go so how does that resonate with you guys hi justin it's jonas um, I think it's very interesting. I think it's, 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 it, there, there's an awful amount of truth in that, um, in, in the industry in which I work, where sometimes people only hold on to a job for a couple of months for whatever the reason is. Um, I've, I've had a variety of people senior above me that, uh, didn't sit well with me or I didn't sit well with them or whichever way we, 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 we want to put it. But it's only in, 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 in later years, in the last five, six years more so since I came back from the Caribbean, that um, it, it, it sits better with me. And I look back at those people who I met in my life and job losses that I have had and things like that, that if I'm still carrying it and if I'm still lurking it around, uh, it brings me down in other jobs and moving it forward. So... In the last six years for, for coming back, it felt like a grounding, coming back to Greystones and sitting in our own house again and, and putting your feet back on the ground rather than being in this weird golden bubble that is expat life. But um, yeah, having, having to let go and, and forgiving them for who they are or what they are or how, or how, how I was with them uh, actually helps tremendously. So now I... I it, I, I, I didn't know that story of the two monks, but I think it's a, an absolute true one that you can carry it with you and it starts affecting you in your daily life. And I think that's not, that's not the way to live. So if you can let go, in whichever way that is, if you forgive them or move on from it, at least leave it, leave it behind. Or, but 
don't carry it with you. I think it's it's it, it's very true. So it, it it definitely resonates. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. And and yeah, I I I, I really agree. Especially you know in in your industry, it is hugely difficult. And and my wife used to be number two in in five star hotels um around the world and it's you know it's a hard work environment um but you also have you know very strong personalities um as well that that can that can cause friction and i think the you know if i if i think back to my own working life i was only reflecting on this with my with my son this morning because he's going through his own challenges at the moment and and I, I, rem, I, I just wanted to share a time with him when, you know, I'd completely failed and, and, and then come through it. And it was the first time that I, 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 um, I left employment and I was probably 21, maybe. Um, and I set up a business with a pal of mine, which would subsequently be a business that we would grow very significantly. But at that moment, I set up a business and I was operating out of a really small apartment in North London. Um, I was really isolated from the rest of, of the firm. They were all down on the south coast of England. And I had this small apartment with a fax machine and a laptop and a phone and nobody else. And after three or four months of, of being incredibly isolated, I was starting to really lose all belief in myself to the point where I just decided this isn't going to work and I'm giving up. So I went and told my business partner, I'm going to quit. And I'd already made up my mind and it wasn't going to change. And I went back to working in a bank. That was the same bank that I'd left before I went. And they treated me really badly. My boss wanted to treat me really badly just to kind of rub it in. You left and now you're back. So as a young guy, I was given this <clears throat> horrendous company car, which was it was a big people carrier of my previously been driven by somebody who had a big family um, and I was this young kid who wanted to look cool and this was anything but, <coughs> excuse me. So a great way to go after a young kid is, is after their ego. But anyway, the whole approach in the business was poor. You know, nobody was being particularly pleasant and they all found it quite, quite funny. And I had to go back to, to Ireland, spend time with some family one weekend and I was sitting at the table for dinner feeling like a failure, knowing that I'd come back and I'd given up this job, given up this company. And I subsequently would quit the bank again a year later. But for many years, this six or nine month window was a huge problem in my career and my development because I was always so frightened of what happened in that moment. <clears throat> So I had to do work on myself eventually to go back and forgive my boss, but also forgive myself because, you know, at 21, you're scared out of your brains and I'm, and I'm trying to, you know, build a business. But it's interesting that these little things in our careers have huge impacts on our capacity to then grow and flourish moving forward. Because often then an opportunity presents and you go more, you move towards it, but then the trauma kicks in and goes, oh, remember last time we did this, this didn't work out. So you retreat. So you can often miss opportunities, which is this idea of limiting beliefs. When your beliefs are limited, you're held back. When you start letting go and you're open to stuff, more opportunities become forthcoming. Where does this bring us to in the context of our own individual practice? <clears throat> because it becomes quite interesting if you're in therapy or you're with a coach, you can, you can work through these kind of traumas. You can also do this type of work on your own. And when we are learning to meditate, when we're learning the whole idea of mindfulness, a huge amount of what we're trying to do with our mind and our body is to connect into the nervous system, is to create this capacity to understand what's going on inside ourselves. And as we slow down and as we start to pay attention and as we become more present, we start to be more aware of our triggers. So 
when somebody is particularly stressed, they're very much unconscious in many ways. And it's read this comment here today, which is really quite nice and quite funny, but it's when we live unconsciously and we're living with anxiety and we're living with stress, we're not able to really pay attention to anything. And it's, it's described in, in Zen Buddhism as two friends out on the street <clears throat> and one friend sees another friend coming flying past on a horse. And he says, hey, friend, where are you going? And his friend yells back, I don't know, ask the horse. And in that scenario, the horse is our lives. When we're unconscious, when we're not able to pay attention, when we're on autopilot, things just happen to us constantly. And people who are stressed will always think, well, you know, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. The next thing is going to go wrong. But it's because we are overwhelmed with so many issues and traumas and anxieties. And it's come to the point where, you know, it's like the water bottle. It's full to the brim. It's starting to overflow. So it's the whole idea of the more stress, the more anxiety, and the more trauma that I have in my life, the less space there is for me. And the less space there is for me, the less I like being me. And if you play it to its, to its ultimate scenario, where people start to feel that suicide is an option, quite simply, it's because it's all become too much. They don't have the capacity to deal with it anymore. And their understanding of how they see anybody else has all subsided. They just simply believe that the noise and the chaos in my head is just too much. And actually, in fairness, the world will be better without me. So it's why it's so important to catch anxiety and stress as early as possible. And to have conversations with people who we think look anxious or stressed. But also to catch ourselves as early as possible. So the idea of mindfulness and meditation is the capacity to be with ourselves. This opportunity creating a time for ourselves. And in, but in Buddhist psychology, we don't believe in therapy as a long-term basis, anything but a typical client will work, me or somebody like me, for maybe eight to 12 sessions. And after that, we're finished. Because we go in and we face the problems. And we come to terms with them. And we let go of them. A lot of the times... In Western therapy, you can be provided with tools to navigate around these problems. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with that. But stepping into it, letting go of it, and coming to terms with it can be very helpful. And when you work that alongside meditation practice, where you spend each day, just checking in with yourself. It's like therapy for the long haul. Every day you sit down, every day you check in, every day you show up for yourself. And it's just that self-sustaining practice over the long haul. Hi, it's John. Can anybody hear me? Hi, John. How's it going? Hi. Good, yeah. It's funny you say that. Um, I had a therapy session today. And it was about my 11th, 12th. And the therapist said, don't know if I could do anything for you anymore, to be quite honest. 
we've three more sessions so what do you want to do with them i said well let's do a tune-up every month and wrap them up because we've taken it as far as we could so i hear what you're saying well that's concerned uh plus you talk about the suicidal thought that's the one i had one in the middle of my depression a couple of months ago, it was the clearest thought I've ever had. Everything else was confusion and pain and suffering and uh, everything else was going around me. It was just crashing down around my ankles. But this took me away from all of that. And it was the clearest thought. Everybody said to me, oh, you must have been scared. It wasn't. It was actually very calming. So I can see now why somebody who d takes their own life leading up to it for a week or two people say god they were very happy because they've made that decision because everything else around them is chaos but this is the one thing they can't control so i had to drag myself back in from that moment back into the chaos as well to try and deal with it i rang people or whatever and they pulled me out of it but it was a very clear very very clear moment huge moment of clarity probably the most clearest thing i've experienced in perhaps my entire life because i just went i'm in control now yeah wow thanks john that's that's really really powerful and and it's it's funny but it's it is the um it is probably the most regular way that people will describe that moment when they feel ah, it's a solution. <clears throat> my my own situation where I encountered it too, I I kind of um, felt that I could see I could see a bridge. It's like ah, there's a bridge, there's a way out. And you suddenly think, in all the noise and all the chaos and all the stress. There's a path for me to get out. And, you know, John, you, you, you've had a great um, experience with your therapist and a very honest conversation with therapists as well, which is fantastic, you know, to say, look, let's just use the last three sessions as check-ins, you know, kind of extend the period of time between when we see each other and then just reorientate and see how you're getting on. But having that outlet and having that capacity to be in therapy is huge. And for people who, who get to the point of um, considering suicide in a very serious way, when it gets to the point when you actually start to give consideration to the how, it's so important that they reach out. And yes, people will often say, I can't believe that they committed suicide, but often all of a sudden they feel like there's a solution. And the, and the pathway back and, and um, my situation, I'm not sure about yours, John, but for me, I, I spoke to, to my wife about it. At the time, I said, look, I'm having some really dark thoughts. And I just started with my therapist who later became my teacher. And I remember Sunday morning, sitting at home, it was a beautiful Sunday morning, sitting in the kitchen. And life really was actually quite good there wasn't anything particularly like if i look at it with a with a bird's eye view not in how my mind was at that moment everything was fine but i suddenly had this overwhelming feeling that you know this is the opportunity this is where i'm going to go and and i i sent a text to to my teacher dr chada and i said what are you considering this whole idea of ending my life and I thought maybe I should text you about it I always remember he's he's a very dry and witty man but very straight he just texted me back and he said hmm okay most important thing is don't do anything until tomorrow and we'll meet in my office at nine o'clock and that intervention and instruction allows you to just create that space of a moment to go, okay, I won't do anything until tomorrow and I'll go and see him. And then you do the work and you let go of it. But it's the whole idea of the forgiveness is such an early point in the process. But if we don't spend time on ourselves, do the work, or, you know, 
notice our children, our, our loved ones, our partners who all have, have issues and just give them opportunities to find space and find therapy or find meditation or mindfulness or whatever it is that unfortunately it does snowball and, and, and there are significant consequences and trying to catch people um, before then is, is, is an important thing, but it's, it's a tragedy. Well, I'm glad I didn't do it. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, uh, much better, much, much better these days uh, in good place, thankfully, you know, so actually funny you're talking about your dad and, and the Collins, your brother, I was in your house, actually. Uh, what year was it? In 1980, around that time. I stayed overnight. Myself and Colin were working in Radio City back in the day. So I was in your house, heck in hell, 40 years ago. That's scary. <laughs> That's scary. Yeah, uh, my, my, my dad was... Uh, you know, was, was such a challenged human being. And, and it's, it's a, such a tragic story. My dad died on Christmas Eve and he was 86 when he died. And he spent his, he spent his entire life with um, depression and anxiety and, and had electric shock treatment in, in, in the 80s and was, was you know, suicidal on multiple um, times and, and was, was in St. John of God's. And they they never were able to move towards the idea of you know there is a solution to this so he just was heavily medicated then my dad was a really intelligent bright capable affable man but when you're heavily medicated and then you get into your 50s and 60s and 70s like really with every kind of five years the, the level of medication has to be increased and increased and increased and increased and increased and 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 in the end he was he was more kind of pharmacology than than human um, and just simply because, you know, there wasn't an opportunity to, to help them. There was therapists around in Ireland at the time who, who had those tools. Um, but, you know, for whatever the path was, uh, it wasn't something that, that, you know, my father was able to find. And I think it's, it's just why I like these conversations and why I enjoy sharing this type of information is just, just getting the message out to people that speak to other people speak to your loved ones speak to your speak to your children especially you know talk about feelings and emotions you know we we we, we have kids going through school and and huge amounts of pressure being put on them by parents because you know i want you to to play for this football team or this rugby team or this gaa team or this hockey team and i want you to go to this school and I want you to get these grades and I want you to take those subjects. And then I would like you to go to this university because I really want you to be study medicine or be an engineer. And the more we try and move people to be something that they're not, the more disconnected they get from themselves. And it just creates pain. So it's the whole idea of conversation. So meditation and mindfulness is an opportunity to sit with ourselves, to converse with ourselves. And then of equal importance is the opportunity and the idea of conversing with the people that we love, not being afraid to talk because when we hold on to it, when we suppress it, it will come back. And not only will it come back, but we, we build up the next thing. So it's like a, a leveling up you know something that was traumatic that happened to me when i was seven and then the next decade something difficult might happen when i'm 17 and the next decade something difficult might happen when i'm 25 and the next decade something difficult might happen when i'm 35 and the next decade when i'm 45 and eventually then there's the tipping point and when we get to the tipping point that's where we are ill and, and, you know, the distance, the distance from ourselves, you know, the distance is where we create the disease. It's where we start to feel that we're losing ourselves. Um, there's a comment here. Um, it's my birth mom, whom I only met a few years ago, 
had been suffering her whole life from anxiety and OCD and depression on meds her whole life too. She hadn't got a clue about meditation and mindfulness. I feel so lucky that I'm aware of these tools and practices for my own mental health. And it made sense meeting her where my anxiety originated from. It's an interesting, um, so a really good friend of mine, um, Brian Penny, who, oh, John's coming back in. Lost him there. So a really good friend of mine, Brian Penny, um, who's about to become Dr. Brian Penny, he's just finishing his PhD. And Brian is an extraordinary human being. The two of us have a great love of neuroscience and mindfulness. So how do these two things interconnect? But Brian has, Brian became a, um, a drug addict, spent 17 years as a heroin addict, became clean in 2013, went to UCD, got a degree in psychology, then took a master's in neuroscience at Trinity, and now he's a lecturer in Trinity and, and UCD, and he's written a book called Bonus Time, and um, has a huge amount of influence in, in, in the Irish and UK um, mental health arena, because it's really interesting when you can find somebody who is a heroin addict, who then goes and picks apart, where did it all start? And what Brian discovered was that as a child, he was um, operated on, I think in 1978. And I think it was up on, until 1982 in Ireland. We didn't administer general anesthetics to babies under the age of, I think, three months or six months when they were in surgery. So Brian started to research the fact that the pain body, this whole idea of our nervous system, even as a three-month-old baby, holds on to extreme emotional pain. So when he did all the work in himself, and then he went off and done extensive research, and he still has a research program going on at the moment in, in Trinity College with other addicts, looking at this exact same issue, he realized that the physical and emotional pain that that three-month-old baby had endured meant that he was always holding on to it until such point in time when he found heroin. And then all of a sudden, the pain was gone. And even today, when Brian is still stressed, he often will touch the scar. And the funny thing is, we discovered when we became friends that we were actually operated on for exactly the same procedure a couple of years apart. And both of us nearly died as, as infants. And it's something that I'm exploring now. You know, how did that have an impact on me? But what I find really interesting about this and, and you know, really to, um, to broaden the idea of, of loss as a child, you know, if, we, sorry, if we think about impacts of, of in childhood and, and Louise's comment about um, her birth mother, if what Brian discovered in the context of the pain that a three-month-old baby suffered because they didn't have a general anesthetic, it's reasonable to assume that a child that's separated from its mother, no matter what age it is, will also suffer and continue to suffer. So again, when you look at the statistics of um, adopted children and mental health, statistically, it's a higher percentage of children who suffer from mental health and often people think it's a genetic thing oh you know it's because of the fact that now i've traced it back and it's a genetic thing but what's equally worth deep consideration is this idea that the separation is the cause of the anxiety both for the child and for the mother so both parties continue to remember and and you know erka tolle writes 
so beautifully and eloquently around this whole point, this whole idea of the pain body. The body holds on to the emotional and physical pains. And until such time as we come to terms with that and decide to let go of it, like the two monks, we continue to have the pain. So thanks for, for sharing that, Louise. It's, um, it's very kind of you to share it. And it's, it's, it's touching as well. And it's nice that you have those tools so you're able to help yourself. And, you know, potentially in time, you may be able to influence um, your birth mother as well to, to consider some ideas or to help her. But, yeah, I think there's a lot more about, about um, the impact of trauma at a very, very young age that we're only really starting to uncover now. And, and Brian Penny is, is, at the, is at the forefront of this. Um, so what time is it? All right, it's Lulu. Hello, Lulu. You're in the dark, so I couldn't see you. <clears throat> I thought I thought it was a different, a new Louise. Um. So, Lulu, thanks for sharing that. And I know you've got you know phenomenal resources. And in fairness, you know Lulu was fantastic. Um, on, on International Suicide Day, putting up some great tools for people to um, to go to and use, and, and a great advocate of speaking about suicide. I think it's it's so important that we just bring it into the the narrative of, of conversations at home and schools and everywhere else. So, I think with that, unless anybody wants to to come in and add, we'll wind it up on this. Very balmy, warm evening. And um, it's dark now, but it's very, very warm. It's great for the middle of September. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Mm. It really is. It's really unbelievable. And I, I, have, I have to close my window in my office because otherwise yeah, the traffic don't buy. So I'm uh, kind of medium rare at the moment. <laughs> All right, guys, listen, thank you so much for, for being here. Thanks for participating. Thanks for your questions. Um, and uh, thanks for sharing, John and Louise, Lulu. And uh, I hope everybody has a lovely week. And I hope to see you all again soon. Great. Thanks, Justin. See you next week. Hey, guys. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.